Hello, my name is Mark Taylor and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place for creative and inspiring learning from around the world. Listen to teachers, parents and mentors share how they are supporting children to live their best authentic life and are proving to be a guiding light to us all. Hello and welcome and thank you so much for deciding to spend some time with us here on the Education on Fire podcast. I'd like to thank the National Association for Primary Education for their continued support and sponsorship of this show. NAEP are currently supporting teachers by producing fortnightly videos which cover themes like art, school trips and literacy. Also they are giving away e-copies of their professionally produced journal Primary First. To find out more about the association please go to NAEP dot org dot uk that's n-a-p-e dot org dot uk today i'm talking to professor barry carpenter who has been a head teacher of three schools in the uk and national director at the uk government's department for education and was the first professor of mental health in education in the country barry has published books including one on autism and girls and is in the who's who in the acknowledgement of his national and international contribution to the field of special education He has been awarded the OBE and CBE for services to children with special needs. As we explore his career and research of over 40 years, we talk about how children's development going through their education years is affected by those who are actually born prematurely and the development of the brain and how that impacts their life. So this is a fascinating conversation with Professor Barry Carpenter. Barry, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. You're welcome. So let's start with a little bit of that background. How did you get into education and what are, what are some of your experiences as you went through your, your teaching profession? Um, I knew from very early on that I wanted to be a teacher, but uh, it was probably when I was about 16, I was involved in one of the very first adventure playgrounds for children with disabilities. And it was just such a fantastic experience. I knew then from that age that I wanted to be a teacher of children with special needs. And so Um, that's actually what I trained to do. In in those days, you could go along a special needs pathway. uh, And I trained actually at Westminster College, as it was then. Uh, It's now part of Oxford Brookes University, where I find myself in these latter days of my career. Um, And I took up my first teaching post uh, in in a special school, School for Children with Moderate Learning Difficulties. Two years later, moved into severe learning difficulties, which has really been my main field and and autism and knew very early on that I wanted to lead a school of my own. So, in fact, initially by default, I was a a deputy head and the head went off sick after 12 months. So at the delicate age of 25, I found myself as head teacher Um, and within a year of that applied and got, if you like, my own substantive headship at the age of 26 um, and and had three headships ultimately in the in the span of my uh, career interspersed with uh, a period as an inspector of schools in the pre-offset days I hasten to add, to add um, and some work in higher education but then in t- t- 2008 yep 2008 I was appointed then by the Secretary of State to be the um, national director to lead the the complex needs project in this 21st century, that those two words, complex needs, are much more in teachers' parlance, but we had no legal definition for that. So a lot of my work then has been working with schools, defining that, and a, a national report published in 2011, a book in 2015, and, and this, the last, this last period of my career has been very much exploring who are this new generation of children with complex needs, uh, how are they redesigning what we call special educational needs, because I find myself observing at times 20th century practice for a 20th, 21st century population uh, of children. Um, the rapidity of change in the field of special needs in these last few years has just been enormous. Yeah, and let's let's dive into that a little bit in, in terms of, of the space of your career, how you've seen that change. Is there is there a, a particular area that that's come across in? Is it the fact that some of the definitions of what special needs um, comes under has changed and so therefore the numbers have changed in and out? What's been your experience along those lines? Um, I'm very clear now that in fact, uh, yes, you're, you're right when you talk about definitions. If you like, there's been some refinement of those. Um, Autism would be the obvious example there. Um, 
uh, and that's uh, from my early career where there'd be one or two children with autism in, in, in a school, special school. Now you would find many, many more of those children. But I think what we, uh, what we now know and what we are failing to recognise at times is that there are new causal bases, new reasons for special needs. If I'm doing a Senko piece of, of uh, training, Mark, I will often say to them, think about the special needs register for your school. Which group of children in this 21st century do you think have changed, have rewritten that special needs register? And you'll get very obvious answers like ADHD, autism, latterly um, social emotional mental health needs uh, have come through, all of which are right but are wrong. Because in fact, the causal base for the rises across those three groups, for example, is actually prematurity of birth. It's actually the number of preterm children who are surviving, uh, and particularly those that are born 28 weeks or earlier when the brain is white matter, not gray matter. Uh, and therefore, for those children, their learning pathways are the likes of which we've never seen before. And that's a really interesting starting point, isn't it? Because it's that certainly is something that I've not heard before, um, and and makes an awful lot of sense. And 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 I guess it also comes along the same. Well, it's not the same thing, but in in terms of children's development, even just in terms of their ages within their their starting school life, we know that that makes a difference from a September birthday to an August birthday. And so it it makes perfect sense that you know, like you say babies that are born at certain um, numbers of weeks prematurely, that's going to make a massive difference. It does make a massive difference. Um, and um, the research is unequivocal. For example, at the age of 11, the greatest area of academic challenge for a child born prematurely is mathematics. So then if you ask a teacher, so which area of the brain deals with mathematics, because we need to understand the brain, we need to understand the neuroscience of all of this. And I've even done this to just math specialists, and they can't often tell me. And it's the parietal lobe. Um, and the parietal lobe, from all of my reading, um, but bear in mind I'm, I'm a teacher, so I'm often interpreting the medical stuff, it, it seems to be, if you like, a softer area of the brain, it gets... The, the trauma, the assault, whatever that happens in the in the birth process or the prematurity process. Um, and therefore, that's a, a great challenge for teachers. How do you teach maths to, to children whose parietal lobe is so impaired? And I've done some school-based work, um, which tends to be my research focus. I'm, I'm very much a, a school-based researcher. Um, with a group of teachers in Surrey, I did a piece, and the simple question was, how do you teach maths? to a children born prematurely and the answer at the moment would be Numicon because it's more tangible and tactile. And how do you think this idea, this understanding should change across the board in, in terms of we teach a very narrow curriculum at the moment. Um, bearing this in mind, you know, are there different types of areas of study? Um, if we talk maybe more creative and that kind of thing where, where that brain function is different that actually would support them in, in that kind of sort of cross-curricular idea rather than always specifically focusing on one particular subject. You asked there about was there something we could do across the system. I want to address that first of all. There is one thing, Mark, and that is for every school, regardless of phase, so I'm including secondary schools in this as well, there needs to be a question on the admission form of every school that says, is there anything in the birth history of this child that we need to know? And that isn't about labeling. That's about having a source of information that when a child starts to show particular needs, because the intensity of the classroom tends to illuminate uh, a variety of learning needs in children that perhaps weren't so prominent and evident before the child entered the school system. Um, it could be, for example, that a teacher within a few months is saying to their head, it seems to me that um, this child has some particular language issues. Great kid, enthusiastic learner, but the, the speech and language is just not coming through like I'd expect in a five-year-old. Um, it could be that if on that admission form it says that child was born anywhere between uh, 28 to 32 weeks, we know that's the phase when the Broca's region, the speech and language area of the brain, actually develops. So in fact, our questions and our focus then could be about so what interventions would best help a child born at that phase um, 
So it, it gives us, if you like, signposts that impact on learning. I'm only ever interested in prematurity or some of the new rare syndromes, some of the genetic abnormalities that are coming through. I'm only ever interested in that. I'm not a, not a doctor, I'm not a doctor of medicine. I, I want to know because I want to know how does that impact on the child's learning? If the child learns differently, in what way do I teach differently? Um, and so I think to answer your broader question, to my mind, it's more about the pedagogy, the teaching style that's important, that um, with the child born prematurely, they can often be very anxious children, nobody's fault, but if they were in the incubator for long periods of time, they could be hypersensitive to sounds, for example. So loud sounds in the classroom, because classrooms are busy and noisy places, could actually raise anxiety in the child, which will increase the cortisol level in the brain, which in turn will perhaps block the memory function in the brain, and so that child isn't retaining some of the information in the lessons. And simple adjustments could be made to accommodate that. And I think that idea of personalised learning, I, I, th I think, is key for every child in lots yes. of ways. And and like say the the extreme ends of those, whether they're under the umbrella of gifted and talented, or like say, or whether it's special education needs actually in lots of ways it's just taking every child individually but of course that then becomes very tricky doesn't it with the number of children and actually the way that schools yes. are actually set up yes. um so do you think having you know specialist schools is the only way when you're either end of that spectrum or do you think there is a way of amalgamating the two? Oh, i think there's a way of amalgamating the two and i'm convinced as i was at the beginning of my career i'm still convinced now we need a continuum of provision for a continuum of need um, again, harping back to one of your earlier questions, but combining it with your thread now. Um, so at the beginning of my career, in my first headship, that school would have had a large percentage of children with Down syndrome. Now in special schools, you would not find so many Down syndrome children. The majority of them will be educated in mainstream settings. And rightly so, because that's indicative to me that the way the profession has grown in its ability to include children with Down syndrome into those mainstream settings. But I think at times we need, I'm, I'm going to say it, a critical mass of children in a particular setting in order to learn how you teach some of these new populations of children. Um, otherwise we're diluting the, the impact and the quality of, of our teaching. And of course there's implications there for how we do that now in teacher education. Yes, but I think one of the things that one of the things that we really do know is that teachers who are training are are time poor in terms of the amount of time that they actually are studying in various different things in subjects, let alone the different types of children that they're going to be um, coming in contact with. So, do you think there's enough provision actually at that stage, but also in terms of ongoing support and and professional development as well? And and what sort of things can people do who are listening who think actually I'd like to know more about this? Where can they go and yeah. find that sort of research? Let's take the broader question about teacher education. It's, um, if I build it on from the, my words about prematurity, you can imagine that that group of children have particular emotional needs. The evidence is very clear on that. Um, we've had a longitudinal study in this country. I've not been directly part of that, but um, I have contributed to it at various phases. That followed children born prematurely from the year 2000. So it means by last year, 2019, we had a childhood evidence base like no other country in the world has. We've walked childhood with the prematurely born and learned for and with the child, which I think is a highly commendable approach. So we know, um, for example, that prematurely born children in the teenage years will have particular hormonal issues due to the way their brain is, is scaffolded and can deal with the hormones. What we've begun to do, for example, at Oxford Brooks now, is that work about prematurity uh, is blended into very distinctive special needs modules that uh, students can opt into at undergrad level. And emerging from that, because the premature group, the evidence again is clear, are going to be prone to more mental health issues, we have now stranded mental health as key lectures in undergrad, but having planted the seeds, which is often all you can hope to do in any aspect of undergrad teacher training, we now have a master's in education in mental health in education. So mental health in education. 
This isn't about training the teachers to be doctors or nurses. This is about what is the impact of mental ill health on children's learning, but also, and I tend to like to take a more positive view, how do you build emotional resilience in all of our children? It's a tough world out there. It's a fast moving world. Look at the current situation with the coronavirus. Um, we need to be able to adapt and modify and have good and strong mental health and know how to keep our mental health alert uh, uh, and and fresh. So we we put, if you like, roots in place for teachers to gain higher skills. And indeed, we now have some teachers working at doctoral level. Because this area of mental health is a huge challenge to the teaching profession, we have no pedagogical history. It's never been part of our portfolio. That's nobody's fault. At least we now have the opportunity to address the needs. Uh, and I think it's a very welcome opportunity. And do you think that this is something which will naturally Im- improve organically in terms of as our knowledge and our understanding and, and sharing of this information um, becomes more prevalent, the fact that we will teach in a different way and be more individualised and understanding that actually children's mental health will actually improve because they'll be more aware of themselves and how they fit into the world like you explained. Um, or, or do you think that because the current system is quite strained in some ways and children find that hard, that there has to be some more systematic change to support it from a practical level? Um, I think you're, you're right. I think in time, it's, it is for me about self-regulation. So your point about children will understand more about their own mental health um, is very important. And because there will have been direct and indirect teaching around that, that schools are becoming much more um, mental health aware. What impresses me is that despite the fact that we as teachers have never been trained, and I mean, my professorship at Oxford Brooks is mental health and education, I'm probably only two steps before in front of anybody else in, in the profession. But we needed some leadership for this short period of time of three years. I, I've actually taken up that post at, at Brooks, so I lead towards retirement. And um, I, I do think that um, there are very good initiatives. The mental health first aid training uh, is having a very positive impact on schools. We're going to have mental health leads in schools. There's some very good resources already starting to come out. We've got resources in areas that we've never had resources before. uh, And I think that's to be welcomed. So I do think things will improve. If I bring it down to teaching, and and you've rightly pointed about about, about individual approaches, about personalization, For me, there's one other thing that is key, and that is engagement. When I did the work on complex needs for the DfE across all types of school in the country, when we discovered who are the children with complex needs in our school system, again, for me, the question was, great, how do they learn and how do I teach them? And we discovered then through some very systematic trial work in classrooms that engagement was the single best predictor of successful learning for children with complex needs. And mental health is the most complex of all the complex needs. It's it's the one that will creep up and cohabit with any other form of learning difficulty. It'll cohabit with um, autism. Uh, Between 60 and 70% of young people with autism in the teenage years will develop a mental health issue. For every five children on the special needs register in a school, three will develop a mental health issue. So we know that these are populations that are very vulnerable to mental ill health. So our focus needs to be on emotional well-being. Quite simply, the question I ask teachers is, how do we keep our children emotionally strong? And do you find that there is an easy answer to that in terms of what you get back from the people that do it or does it really open the the debate and the conversation to really develop where they want to move forward from having had that conversation i'm so impressed with my profession in the willingness of teachers to explore what they can do around mental health i look in their eyes mark and i i see the fear golly this is a new area in which i've no experience But alongside the fear, I see the commitment because day in, day out, they are seeing the rapid erosion of children's mental health. And unless children have good mental health, 
they're not going to be successful learners, which is the whole point of them coming to school. So therefore, we must find teaching approaches, not always specifically around mental health, but just in terms of, of compassion in our teaching, compassion and care in our schools, compassion, care and creativity. We as teachers need to have creativity to address issues, for example, around grief. Um, we don't teach grief. And yet we're charged by the Education Reform Act 1988, preparation for adulthood. And grief is part of, of life. It can happen in childhood. It often happens. It will inevitably happen in adulthood. We're great if granddad dies, we support the child. We're great if the pet hamster dies, we're there for them. But in terms of direct teaching about grief, we have no resources. And I've been really pleased the last uh, 12 months, um, the psychologist, Dr. Tina Ray, is producing the most fabulous resources around grief, uh, around well-being, around um, transition. You know, that transition from primary to secondary can destabilize many children's uh, mental health and emotional well-being. So there is this emergence of resources. Um, we just need to find the opportunities in schools for, for teachers to use them, to trial them, to experiment with them. It's new stuff. They're going to have to learn professionally on the hoof. And and I think the key to that, I think, is what you mentioned just a moment ago, which is the creativity, isn't it? Because yes. we, we, yes. we know schools are very time poor when, when you have to yes. kind of, you know, do things at a certain time and, and fit it in with, with the, the current system. But I think certainly that's the reason this podcast was set up was sharing those creative and inspiring things because there are ways of doing it and like you said bringing it all together having an idea of where you want to start and that isn't necessarily about learning maths or english it's about human beings how you connect to yourself how you connect to everybody else empathy all those kind of things and then everything grows out of that and i think when you start from that point of view with the child first then it becomes a very optimistic um future i think you're absolutely right. I, I was asked by a colleague the other day, knowing that I was about to retire, what, what did I think of, of our profession uh, at, this, at this juncture? Uh, and I just said, teaching is a relationship-based profession. That's, for me, the end point. It's a starting point, and it's the end point. It's about those relationships. It's about the relationships that teachers have with children, that children have with their teachers. And it's also about how um, teachers speak to the to the head teacher and at the interaction there. It, it is about compassion, about kindness. Teaching is a relationship-based profession. They can throw at us whatever policy initiative they want. They can bring in whatever inspection systems they want to, but they cannot take that away from us. And, and I often ask teachers, if I'm making that point, just reflect, what was it that called you to be a teacher? And don't walk away from that question. Because until you know what it is in your humanity that makes you want to be a teacher of children, an inspirer of their learning, then you will be no good to the children if you cannot answer that question. And I think having a community of people um, that feel the same way, and, and, and that's the, the great thing these days about um, the online world as, as well as the physical world, is the fact that you can get that in lots of many different settings. And I think surrounding yourself with, with those types of people gives you that emphasis every day yes. to feel like you're being supported in, like you said, the essence of what it is that you want to do. Yes, you're absolutely right. One of my um, doctoral students at Oxford Brooks is actually exploring compassion in teaching because teaching is emotional work. We've intellectualized teaching. We've, we've had some very um, arid curriculum models at times, um, but we forget that there has to be an underlying humanity uh, and human beings, as we're seeing again in the current crisis, are at their best when they can show kindness and compassion to others. It's what marks us out from other species. Uh, and it's certainly the hallmark of teaching. The best teaching I see is not always about inspirational curriculum. It is about the, the quality of relationship that existed between teacher and learner, the child. 
I think that's I think that's very true, and and I think certainly in this this current crisis with our schools being closed down now, one of the conversations we've certainly had within our house is the fact that is the scaffolding comes down of what school is. You know, you're not yes. going there in the morning; you're going to be doing it at home. The day is going to yes. look different, and and that puts a little bit of um, anxiety in, but it also opens up a whole different way of being. One of the conversations we had was, you mean I don't have to get up at this time to physically <laughs> get to school? You know, and 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 the joy that came from just that. That one small thing but it was really interesting the way that you know the structure started to change but the the, the morph and, and the understanding of what that might mean was a very positive one and so like yeah. I say it brings out all sorts of humanity um in different ways and I think like I say because we're all supporting each other and it's it's that connection even if it's with you within your family or your neighbor or or people within your your learning community you're all in it together and I think once you start to feel that I think all those things we've talked about so far really comes through yes you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I think, isn't this a time for families to, within themselves, but looking out to others in what, whatever ways are permissible, it's time to, to model to our children what compassion and care for human beings might actually be for our fellow human beings. Absolutely. Um, so just to finish off, you, you talked about your book and you've talked about some great resources there. Can you just give us a pointer of where we can go and find out more to, to discuss these sorts of things um, sure. individually and, and, and with the people that we're actually educating children with ourselves? Yes. Well, I've talked a lot about children with complex needs. So um, there is a, a book that I wrote with some colleagues. Um, it's called Engaging Learners with Complex Learning Difficulties, uh, and it's published by Routledge. Um, and the follow-up piece of work to that latterly has been um, the work on girls and autism, um, which again I wrote with Professor Francesca Happe and Joe Edgerton, um, was published last April. And that book has just been phenomenal because this is a group that um, often these girls get identified in the teenage years due to self-harm or anorexia or depression. Um, we've been missing girls with autism. Um, and that book, quite simply, is called Girls and Autism. And uh, within three days of its launch, actually topped Amazon Education and has taken me so far uh, to 11 countries around the world. I'm not traveling at the moment because of the virus, but um, it's even been, you know, I've even been called to, to launch it in, in Dubai, um, an area of the world where you wouldn't think they'd want to talk about girls or autism, but they did and very enthusiastically. The other resource I mentioned, the ones by Dr. Tina Ray, um, are published by Nurture UK. Nurture UK is a fantastic website, particularly if teachers want to look at the issues around attachment, which many of our children have attachment issues these days, or uh, around bonding and emotional development. Uh, some of our other work, the wellbeing toolkits, uh, are published through Hinton House. Fantastic. Well, Barry, it's been a real privilege to talk to you today. And Thank you, Mark. There's so much to, to, to think about there. And, and I think just for me the the biggest takeaway of just the starting from that community the starting about the relationships we have both with the children that we're involved with and also the staff and the people around i think um certainly at this time feel, feels very very powerful so thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and um, it's been my pleasure and we'll have details of all the things that we've been talking about on the show notes of this podcast so people can easily click through and find out those details so yeah thank you very much again thank you mark Thanks for listening to the Education on Fire podcast. For more information of each episode and to get in touch, go to educationonfire.com. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.